Please take your Bibles, and I'm turning to Matthew chapter 6, and I'm reading beginning with verse 24 down to the end of chapter 6 of Matthew. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Thus endeth the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Matthew is the gospel which begins and ends with Emmanuel. We begin with the prophecy that his name shall be Jesus and his name shall be Emmanuel. He will be God with us. And at the conclusion of Matthew's gospel, Jesus, he says, And lo, I am with you always. I am with you. Jesus, he is God with us to the very end of the age and to the very end of the terra firma on which we dwell. Matthew begins and ends with Emmanuel. Matthew also begins and ends with authority. Last week we considered how that Jesus came in his lineage to be born in Bethlehem of the royal line of David. Herod the Great was the great leader of that time, maniac, despot, tyrant though he was. He bore the title Herod the Great to distinguish himself from all of the other Herods that would also rule in that vicinity. He was the great builder. He was not great in character, but great in his exploits, great in his aspirations and in his designs. Jesus, on the contrary, was not only great in character, he was great in every way, and the authority that Herod the Great so sought for himself and that he so craved and that he so clung to tenaciously, killing even wives, family members, those round about him without the slightest twinge of conscience. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, we have this word of ringing authority where Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. One preacher in my hearing said, now that covers a tremendous amount of territory, doesn't it? Yes, indeed it does. 
If Jesus, the one who we have just started to dig into his life, if Jesus indeed is the one who we are building towards to hear that that punchline, all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth, it is vital, it is absolutely vital that we attend to his life where did he come from? Who is he? What did he do? What did he say? No wonder the people hung upon his words because authority for Jesus was not simply something that had been bestowed upon him. It was ingrained in him. He lived and breathed. If he had been cut, he would have bled authority. Jesus he was the very personification of authority, it all having been given to him. Within the Gospel of Matthew, we have very early, essentially right at the outset of Jesus' earthly ministry, three chapters which are outlining a single sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Last week, we considered chapters 1, 2, and 3, and chapter 4 deals with how Jesus, with great authority, bested the devil and all of his temptations in the wilderness, and then how he started to gather to himself disciples, and how that his ministry began in Galilee. Then the Sermon on the Mount some have called it the constitution of the kingdom of God. It is the rules and the regulations by which we will live through all eternity. Blessed, Jesus said, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus would continue on through the Beatitudes. I especially want to take you to the middle chapter of this three-chapter sermon. The middle chapter, chapter 6, which I read for you in just a moment ago, it's striking in that it begins with our righteousness and the warning that we not seek after and that we not make a show of our righteousness because as we read in the Old Testament, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's dirty. Even our best aspirations and what we have put forth as our best effort is as dirty, filthy rags. Chapter 6 begins with our righteousness and it concludes with his righteousness. Big, big difference. And through the course of chapter 6, Jesus, as he stood on the hillside there by the Sea of Galilee, undoubtedly, he shares with people how that they can move from those things that people put forth as a show, as a display, and how that we might move to truly seek his righteousness and to be honoring and pleasing before him, to seek his kingdom. Matthew is also the gospel of the kingdom of God. And of course, in any kingdom, you have a king and Jesus, he is it. Now, I spoke to you about authority. Jesus, he comes. And at the end of this sermon, the people, they're looking at each other and they're speaking the words, and they're certainly thinking this very thought, this is incredible. This man speaks with such authority, he is different than any other voice, any other preacher that we have ever heard. We've gone to the synagogues and we've heard the rabbis, we have heard from the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and we have heard them bicker about well, this person says this, but this one says that, and maybe it's somewhere in the middle that the truth is to be found, and we're not perfectly sure. Jesus, he spoke with authority, 
and why not? He spoke of heaven. He spoke of his heavenly father, but he did not speak out of some book. He spoke as one who had been there. He had been there. Jesus had dwelt in the glories of heaven for all eternity past. He knew and he knows every last part of it. Jesus, he had dwelt in everlasting life and he knew what righteousness and holiness was all about. And so he could speak as no other could ever speak. He could speak of his heavenly father far better than Moses. Moses had had his encounters with God there on Mount Sinai, but those were fairly brief episodes, we might say. But Jesus, from all eternity past, dwelling with the Father, so intimately acquainted of one person, of one essence, we declare in the creed, of one holy essence. So Jesus, he speaks with great authority and he speaks to the people. First of all, in chapter six, he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Big, big problem. We are ever wanting to be on parade even our best efforts, there is that subtle, subtle temptation that we put on a show. And Jesus said, if you do that, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. And who do you really care about? Do you want to have your reward here of people and of their applause, of their ooh, ah? Or do you want to have the applause of heaven, the applause of the Almighty and of his reward? Jesus says, first of all, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Here we have people who are holding up their wallet, holding up their, their money, and they're pulling out a bit, and they're, with great show, putting it into the cup of someone who was asking alms of them. And Jesus says, no, 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 don't do that. That is not for the praise of God. That is for the honor of men. And he says, truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full, in full. There's nothing left that God will give to them. And Jesus says, let your giving be so very different. Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And then your heavenly father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So just as he said, when you give, Jesus then says, when you pray, and he says, you're not to be like the hypocrites in this either. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on street corners so that they may be seen by men. And Jesus again, he says, truly I say to you, they have their reward in full, in full. They've taken it all. And Jesus says, your praying is to be of a very different kind. When you pray, go into your inner room, into your closet. Close the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your heavenly Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And Jesus here in Matthew's gospel, he gives the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Then, one more time, Jesus said, when you give, when you pray, not if you give, because for the child of God, giving is as much a part of them as breathing. When, not if, when you give, when you pray, and thirdly, when you fast, once again, Jesus, he talks about the hypocrites who did it all wrong. It was for their righteousness to be on display. When you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men that they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Three times to do with giving, praying, and fasting, Jesus uses the exact same form to cry against what is being done, what was being done in his day, and we could rightly cry against those who even in our day, all round about us, their charity, their prayers, their intercession with God pressing in through fasting is, doesn't have anything to do with seeking God's favor. It's all about impressing people round about. Truly, I say to you, Jesus says, they have their reward in full. Jesus says, look, if you're going to fast, this is how you do it. You wash your face and anoint your head with oil so that your fasting will, it'll be passed by by others. Nobody will know it that you are pressing in with God in such a way and your Father, your Heavenly Father, who sees what is going on in secret, he will reward you. Then we come to this portion, which I have read for you. No one can serve two masters. Here is the essence of what is taking place through righteousness. Jesus, he had talked about the applause of men, or the applause and the reward which God holds out. We cannot have both. They are diametrically opposed to one another. They are radically different. If we are content to go for the applause and the reward such as this world has, meager, meager as they are, though in fact they are immediate, and that, that certainly is the attraction of them, is that they are right there. There is no, as it, what is called, delayed gratification. It is immediate. If we fall down and if we go for the applause and the rewards of what people say about us in this world, then we forfeit the blessing and the privilege of what God has for us. No one can serve two masters, Jesus said. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or vice versa, he will de be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You cannot serve heaven and earth. You cannot serve the divine and the human. Jesus, he undoubtedly saw in the faces of people round about him that there was some puzzled looks. The expectation in Jesus' time, and this comes out very plainly in the disciples' comments at various times, when Jesus 
he talks about the rich and how with difficulty will a rich man enter into the kingdom of heaven. The people of Jesus' day, they assumed that if anyone was a shoe-in with God, it was the rich. Look, you know, behold how God has blessed them, how that he has pleased them. He is pleased with them. We're not very impressed with them. We don't like hanging around them. They're rather arrogant snobs. But God, he, he obviously is pouring out blessing upon them. Jesus, he comes and he says, Don't worry about your life as to what you will eat, drink, or what you will put on, the clothing that you will wear. Jesus, he asks the question, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Jesus, he surely had some birds that he could point to very easily and draw the attention of the crowd to. He said, look at the birds. There, that one, just right over there. Look at the birds. They don't have a bag of seed. They don't have a hoe over their shoulder. They don't have a watering can. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, reap, gather into barns. What happens is that your heavenly Father feeds them. And if he feeds them, won't he feed you? Don't you think that a human soul, that your life, that you made in the image of God are so much more valuable to your heavenly Father than that little bird is. Why are you worried about adding a single hour to your life? Why are you worried about clothing? The flowers of the field, look at them. Surely, once again, Jesus could have easily pointed to the flowers round about the crowd. And he says, I tell you that even Solomon, in all his glory, and Jesus, he was not reading out of the Old Testament. Jesus had been there. Jesus had been there to see the splendor of Solomon in his earthly reign about a thousand years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Jesus had seen it from heaven's glory. Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed, he was not dressed or clothed such as these flowers that are here today and are shriveled tomorrow and others take their place. O oh, you of little faith, will not God clothe you? And Jesus, he says, do not worry then what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear for clothing. The Gentiles, they eagerly seek all these things. Your heavenly Father knows. We talk about the omniscience of God, his all-knowingness, that he knows all, everything. But I'm not sure that we really get that. And maybe we would say, all right, he knows everything, but he really doesn't care. He really could care less, or he could care sort of half measure. He not only knows, but his care is poured out upon each and every one of us. Your heavenly Father knows what you need, and he knows you need the things of food, of drink, of clothing. What we are to set as our priority, as opposed to those things that this world clamors for, food, drink, prestige, clothing, all on and on it goes. Jesus says, this is what you are to do. Not seeking your own righteousness, 
not making a parade or a show of it. You are to seek his kingdom and his right way, his righteousness, and all these other things, all these things will be added to you in their own good time and order. Jesus says, don't, don't, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus, in verse 11 of chapter 6, in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that he instructed for his disciples, it was given, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day. You remember in the wilderness when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and making their way towards the promised land, there was the manna that was laid out in the desert by God every morning. Every morning. Some of the people tried to gather enough for two days and they found that it went bad. Every day God would provide for them what they needed and so it is with you. Set aside all those vain attempts to be pleasing, impressive in this world's opinion. Set that aside and make God's kingdom, make his kingdom and his righteousness your wholehearted goal and desire, your passion. Even at the outset of this new year, let it be your priority and your wholehearted, con whole, wholly consuming passion to the praise of God. Lord, we hear of how that you speak of our righteousness, filthy rags. It is what this world clamors after. We try to be impressive. We try to be amazing, but it all goes bad. It's all a mistake. Lord, I pray that for every one of us, we would seek first your kingdom, your righteousness, and let all of these things leave them in your hand. So, Lord, work your will in our hearts and draw us to yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.